Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. Each week, we interview top experts in physical therapy, pain science, and integrative pain care. You'll learn the most up-to-date information for treating and reversing persistent pain. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe Tata. Hey there, friend. Welcome to this week's episode of the Healing Pain Podcast. Today, we're discussing the different types of psychological therapies available for the treatment of chronic pain. Do they help? Are they safe? How much confidence can we place in them? And what we should further investigate regarding this topic as we move forward. My expert guest this week is Dr. Amanda Williams. Amanda was a full-time clinician in a pain management program for many years and then transitioned to teaching and research. Today, she's a professor of clinical health psychology at University College London and a consultant clinical psychologist at the Pain Management Center, University College London Hospital in the United Kingdom. On today's episode, we discuss the findings from her recent paper called Psychological Therapies for the Management of Chronic Pain in Adults, which can be found in the August 2020 Cochrane Library of Systematic Reviews. The paper updates the current literature regarding the effectiveness of different kinds of psychological therapy, including traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and behavioral therapy. It also asks the question as to whether these interventions are safe and if we've investigated safety and harm enough in the literature. This paper was well received by many. However, as with any study, there are some questions regarding the findings and how much emphasis we should place on psychological therapies versus other types of therapies to help people living with chronic pain. The paper also had some significant criticisms as to the developing research base around acceptance and commitment therapy for chronic pain, a topic we've discussed many times on the podcast. So I think it's important that as professionals and as just general members of the public, we're informed as to all sides of the argument and all sides of the literature and research and perspectives with regard to the various treatments of psychological therapies for the treatment of chronic pain. We discuss all of this and more on today's episode. Okay, let's begin and let's meet Dr. Amanda Williams. Hi, Amanda. Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast. It's great to have you here this week. Hi, Joe. It's great to be here. I was, I think maybe I got an alert one day from PubMed because I have lots of different alerts set up for different types of studies and topics that interest me. And your study came up and it's a study, of course, everyone can access. It's an important study. It's called Psychological Therapies for the Management of Chronic Pain in Adults. It's a review that was published in August of 2020. You can find it in the Cochrane Library of systematic reviews. And I wanted to have you on to discuss discuss the important findings of that paper, as well as some other questions that people may have around psychological therapy. So of course, first, thank you for doing the study. It's important work that I know people, of course, in the UK will use as well as other people around around the world. Um, Tell us why it's important that you publish this study now. Well, it's an ongoing question for lots of people with chronic pain and those who provide their services, what should we be providing? Um, Is there one method that's better than others because it can be quite disappointing? And um, we've done previous reviews in this series, but they need updating as people bring out new studies. Otherwise, People don't know whether to go back to the old reviews or try and add on new studies. And the point about doing systematic review is you're pretty sure you've got everything that's out there. We don't restrict it just to English language. Um, We do put a few restrictions on, but we're pretty sure we've got all the relevant studies. And then we put them all together into an analysis, which is obviously much more powerful than any single analysis. So there are nearly nine and a half thousand people in this paper by putting all the results together. And that means you can be much more confident about your results than if you have one population with its own quirks, which they all have. Right. And so this was 2020. You did publish a study in 2012. So this is an update to that one. Can you tell us how this review is different from the one in 2012, other than obviously more information, more people pulled, more data? Yeah, I mean, it is almost double the size. Um, But also, we were able to 
separate different types of therapy. What we did in the 2012 one was we still put everything psychological into one analysis, as it were. Um, we do separate the different outcomes and immediately after treatment from long time after treatment. But this time we are able to separate cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT, and behavioral therapy, which is a funny mix of, of things, which I'll probably say a bit more about. Yeah, I mean, I guess as you're touching on that, maybe you can tell us about the different types of psychological therapies that are out there um, for the treatment of pain or that professionals are using and implementing into their practice? Well, people are really picking a whole lot of things out of the toolbox and really every trial varies. There, there are some changes over time that you see. Early on, people had a lot more faith in things like relaxation and attention diversion methods and so on. Um, those were rather disappointing. Um, and some of the earliest methods put much more emphasis on exercise, whereas now I think there's a bit more on people getting to do what goals they want to do without seeing exercise as a, an essential stepping stone. Methods have changed from the early ones in stress management to more cognitive ones, which are very like those used in the mental health field. Um, challenging and trying to change uh, thoughts which lead to uh, over pessimistic predictions and over cautious ways of going about life with pain. And then the most recent ones, uh, not all that recent, but trials take a while to pick up on introductions um, of acceptance and commitment therapy where people are asked more to disengage from their thoughts, not to engage with them and grapple with them and, and, and change, but to disengage from them and, and take a more dispassionate approach to what they do and how they do it. So this study really focused on those three areas. So co traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and behavioral therapy, so to speak. Yes, and the behavioral therapies are a mix of things like relaxation and biofeedback, more uh, social reinforcement of what people do and don't do, which can be very activity-based, so they overlap with other things. Um, and some very specific uh, work towards goals by very specific quotas, um, which again overlaps with some of the other work towards goals. So they're not, you know, they're not walls between these methods. And of course, in practice, they do merge a lot. Yeah. So underneath that, so people, people who listen to this podcast are very, or I would say relatively familiar with CBT and ACT. Um, when you mention behavioral therapy, can that be used synonymous with, let's say, operant condition type approaches? Yes, operant conditioning, uh, I described as social reinforcement because that's really the powerful bit of it. But people can also observe what cues affect their behavior in their own lives. But a lot of it is about trying to make sure that when people try new things and manage them despite pain, that, um, that it's recognized and um, in, enjoyed and celebrated almost by those around them rather than people saying, are you sure you're okay? Was that a good idea? If you hurt tomorrow, I'm not going to be sorry for you. But, you know, it's just really, really discouraging for people who've taken their courage in both hands and had a go at doing something they're quite concerned about doing. Yeah. What were the outcomes that you were tracking in this particular review for to, that people can look back to and say, okay, there's some really good data that these outcomes are either there or not there regarding this systematic review. We just used three. Uh, that was another change from 2012 when we had four. Um, so pain, because um, whether it's planned or not, pain does seem to change with these therapies, but it's not usually the main target. In earlier studies, perhaps it was more from the main target, but I think in a pain study, it's essential to measure pain and to recognize that it's there. So it 
we analysed it. But the two really important ones are disability and distress. So what people couldn't do because of the pain and the anxiety and the demotivation and the you know, low mood and, and so on that it caused them. So pain, disability and distress. Yes. And so I think disability people understand because they're obviously we're talking about functional disability, so to speak. So what people can do regarding physical activity and their ADLs potentially work, things like that. With yeah, regard- it can even mean social things as well. Mm-hmm. You know, whether people get to see their friends and family and enjoy time with them and whether they can do creative things. Um, I mean, of course, work is really important and so is self-care, but it's, it's quite important that we see people's lives um, as, as broadly as possible. Yeah. And when you mentioned distress, can you um, kind of build that out a little bit for people, what distress means uh, in the context of the study? Yeah, it's most often measured in terms of depression, but people aren't necessarily in a clinical range of depression. So it's more like, you know, somewhere mild to moderate kind of low mood uh, that might fluctuate. And a lot of that, of course, is because people are not living the lives that they would be doing without pain and they're immensely frustrated about what they can't do or feel it's not safe to do. Um, and so it also merges a bit with anxiety, which is why I think the term distress is quite useful. Anxiety is usually referred to more around acute pain, but of course there's anxiety all the time about should I do this, should I carry on, should I stop now and take a break? Should I try another doctor? Should I go back to the doctor? I went, you know, all these questions all the time for people with no clear guidance and no doubt people around them all saying different things and giving heart, you know, genuinely meant, but (laughs) different advice. Um, And um, of course, if, if you feel that there's something wrong with you that isn't quite understood, certainly you don't quite understand yourself, and that you might make yourself significantly worse by pushing very hard to do something or um, doing it in the wrong way, then it can be really frightening to try to do things that people tell you are safe, but then they're not the ones who are going to suffer if it doesn't work out. So I think there is a lot of anxiety around that we don't really engage with adequately. Right. So as far as the psychosocial distress, you're saying that depression and anxiety are a factor, but in this study, you really just zeroed in on depression as the one variable. No, it's more that um, you pull the measures that people use and more people used, if they used one or other of anxiety and depression, more people use depression. But quite a few um, of the scales that people used were for both, and then we used the, the combination where we could. And in any case, you know, depression questionnaires have anxiety items on them and, item, and anxiety ones have depression on them. They're not, they're not opposites, they're very close. Yeah. Well, give us, since you're here, give us the update and tell us what your study, how, how your study updates our current knowledge on psychological therapies and their impact. Well, we set, um, we set a sort of threshold for studies. Um, of they had to have at least 20 people in each arm of the trial. So say you had CBT versus behavior therapy versus waiting list. Um, Each of those had to have at least 20 people in them by the end of treatment. And that cuts out a lot of small trials, but small trials are notorious for producing anomalous results um, really Ideally, we would use an even higher bar, to be honest. We would use something more like 50, but that would cut out an awful lot of trials. So we had, we had that as a bar. It had to be face-to-face treatment because internet ones we've reviewed elsewhere and mixing them up doesn't really help. And um, we also required that it was taught by psychologists or people adequately trained. They couldn't just be reading a script um, and uh, or or have done a weekend course because (laughs) delivering 
uh, psychological treatment properly, it isn't just reading a script or using common sense. It actually needs, you know, as you talk to each person, you're tailing it around their needs and their strengths and their other things. So um, it's, it's, given that most of our trials were of CBT, because they tend to be the larger trials, so they, more of them made it through our gate. And they showed, in general, small but very definite improvements in disability and distress, both at, um, at straight after treatment and at six to 12 month follow up. Um, some of the results were not quite so clear at follow up, and of course, it matters that the effects last. And um, this was against treatment as usual. If you compare with another treatment, you get much less effect because, of course, you've got two strong things going against each other. But most people's choice is not, would you like this psychological treatment or that one? It's, would you like this or nothing? <laughs> so that's perhaps more like real life. So CBT looked good, but the changes are really small. These are average changes, so they're made up of people who change a lot and people who change you know, not at all, and a few who get worse. And then um, a few trials of behavior therapy made it through. They're mostly earlier trials, so an awful lot of the small trials disappeared. And they really didn't look um, very good at all. Nothing much changed. And our confidence in the findings, which is to do with things about the quality of evidence, was much lower than it was for CBT. And then the surprise to a lot of people, um, in, including us, was only five trials of ACT made it through the gate. There are an awful lot of small trials of ACT, which is a, a bit surprising given that the more recent and recent trials tend to be bigger. But anyway, um, and there we just weren't seeing any improvement or where we were, the quality of evidence was so low that we couldn't be sure, you know, that add, the next trial that's um, published when it's added won't change the results in a negative direction. So it's, that was really a bit surprising <laughs> um, given the, the strength of um, take up of ACT by practitioners all over the place. So there's been sufficient or a moderate amount of evidence based on your review that shows that traditional cognitive behavioral therapy has small but significant changes for people and looked at these larger scale trials. Yeah. yeah. So let's, let's talk to people with pain first, because on this podcast, we have both people who have pain who are interested in learning more about alternatives and what they can do to um, self-manage their pain. And of course, we have professionals. What does this mean first for people living with chronic pain? Well, I think it should give them confidence that if they're offered CBT, they stand <clears throat> a good chance of making some improvement in disability and distress, coming out of it less distressed and more able to do the things they want to do, which is good news but it's not going to turn their lives around uh, completely. And we're still unsure of the longer term effects uh, of this. I mean, ideally, one's talking about changes in behavior, which then not only last, but um, as it were, start being used for all sorts of things that people weren't initially doing, because if they, you know, if they work, they should work for new things if someone starts to think of going back to work, for instance. So that was, um, I think that should give them confidence. We wouldn't want them to take the message that ACT is not helpful. We, we're not saying ACT is not effective, but the evidence is just not there to say it is or it isn't. And so what we would like, and this isn't, I mean, I think, I hope it would be of interest for patients, but it's not the thing that patients can do, we would like ACT to be a bit more critical about evaluating itself and evaluating itself um, with the same outcomes as other people are using. There are a lot of ACT 
trials that just measure acceptance at the end. And of course, people are better at acceptance. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're able to do what they want to do more. It could do, but we can't assume it. And people didn't necessarily come to the course saying, I want to be more accepting. They may have come saying, I want to be able to garden or play with my grandkids or go back right. to work. So, you, so, as a, so as a researcher, you kind of shifted gears on me just a little bit there, but as a researcher talking to another researcher, you're saying that um, ACT looks very positive, but you'd like to see larger scale studies that are, have more power to them and have the same ruler, if you will, or litmus that all cognitive behavioral interventions are using. So for example, what you're saying is oftentimes in ACT, there are core processes, the six core processes of ACT, and they're using, you mentioned, one of them pain acceptance as the measure. But in traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, they're not necessarily looking at pain acceptance. No, and well, there are a few trials that do, and I think that's very interesting because it enables us to understand, you know, obviously we want to look onto the bonnet and see how, how all this works. Yeah. And it could well be that there are common processes for which we use different language and, um, you know, apparently different methods, but actually it's all doing the same thing. That's yeah. perfectly possible. Yeah. And, you know, acceptance and commitment therapy grew out of cognitive therapy and still does share quite a lot of thinking. Um, yeah, but, but it's, we, we have to think about what matters most to patients. And I'm not saying, um, patients or people with pain who come into these programs. And I'm not saying that distress and disability are the only things. And if you ask patients, as they did in a very large thing in the States, what mattered most, the thing that mattered most was enjoyment of life. We never measure that. But actually, what a, what a lovely thing to have as one's target. And things like social relationships, concentration, memory, sleep, things we don't routinely measure, they all came out very high. Um, so I think we need to be careful not to focus on things we think are important, mm -hmm. you know, flexibility and so on. Those may be why therapies work, but we can't be 100% sure and they're not a proxy for, for real life. Yeah, we have, we have lots of questions still, of course, and that's why we do research like this. One of yeah. the things, I, as I was reading through... Well, you already mentioned this point, which I think is important to bring up. So in this study, in this review, you had those three or four pain intensity, disability, and distress. Um, in your previous one, 2012, you looked a little bit more at um, pain catastrophizing and other mechanisms and moderators of pain, which I found interesting as well. In this study, you made a, a, a strong mention of long-term outcomes. And I think the question that maybe we should ask ourselves as clinicians is that we see people for six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, you know, maybe if you're in a inpatient chronic pain, multidisciplinary program that lasts for three months. And then we don't see people again. They're gone. Out of sight, out of mind. And I almost wonder, you know, it's kind of like when COVID hit, after a while, all of us are saying, I, I haven't seen my dentist to get my teeth cleaned in months. <laughs> so I need to go back and get my teeth cleaned. And we have some of the, you know, most challenging people who are suffering physically as well as emotionally. And they go through our care, but we don't follow them at long term. We don't give them a booster session, if you will. So how does your study start to look at those questions and start to make us think about, okay, what should we be doing for the long-term care to support people effectively? Well, we don't, we don't really look at that. And just giving people the treatments and then following them up at longer and longer time intervals doesn't necessarily answer any of the questions about what people need. But interestingly enough, if you look at the trials of giving people booster sessions or refresher sessions, as they're often called, the evidence is they don't make any difference. People like them, they get high satisfaction scores. People say, yes, they're glad they came, but nothing changes in terms of distress or disability or um, other outcomes that people use. And for me, in a way, that's not terribly surprising. I think what, what I would love to be able to do, but nobody would ever fund, 
is to have a little team of the people who did pain management to go to people in their own homes and problem solve with them about the difficulties they'd had putting stuff into practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they didn't learn it first time, then a one day refresher is not going to, <laughs> is not going to do the trick. But assuming that people did pick up a whole lot of different ways of doing things, um, when they were doing pain management, then the question is, what is it that makes it difficult at home? And of course, there are lots of things that can make it difficult at home, from the physical layout to who they live with or who isn't around as a support and resource. Um, we know that um, with work, getting people back to work, it's never enough to just uh, intervene with the person themselves. You need to intervene with the workplace as well. Because however adaptable and thoughtful about pain management someone is, if their line manager says, no, you're not doing things any different to anyone else, or you come back 100% or not at all, and you've got to do that you know, within the next few weeks, it's, it's not going to work. So we've kind of put the burden of making the whole thing work forever on the person themselves. And... I think there's a lot in the context we, that we just don't know about and we need to get better at knowing about, but we're not going to do it by inviting people back to our clinics. Yeah, that's interesting. But that's my dream. <laughs> <laughs> well, that shifts things a little bit from the psychological to the social part of things. Mm. And as, as you're talking, I'm sure if there are occupational therapists listening to this, they're probably cheering you on because a lot of the work and the theories that they have in occupational therapy focus on therapy actually in yeah. the home or at work itself or in the school environment, which is interesting versus yeah. coming to a very institutionalized setting where it's, you know, clean and perfect, so to speak, but life isn't always clean and perfect, right? Yeah, it's interesting that um, my, the, the pain team I work in very, very part time, um, but they're a very large and excellent pain team at University College London Hospital, has turned to doing lots of groups um, online for COVID mm -hmm. and uh, they're working astonishingly well and they are very, very popular with, yeah. with patients who no longer have that awful business of trying to find their way into central London and sort out parking on public transport or pay for taxes or all the rest of it. And it just, it, they just feel different, I think, in their own homes. It, it is harder for them to make the connections between them that are an important part of all those group programs, yeah. that support. And I sometimes wonder if we could do more to facilitate that. But when I started, we didn't have the technology we now have, and people very quickly set up their Facebook things and WhatsApp groups and so on as, as a patient group, and a lot of important stuff goes on in that. What does your review say the same or what does it say that's different versus past reviews or other reviews that are out there that may not be Cochrane based reviews? No, no. Um, well, on the ACT side, it's uh, not as positive as the other reviews. And that's largely because the other reviews took on board the smaller trials and also I think used um, it, included some of the online ones and you know that's impressive if the online ones also had had good effects um it's not that the cbt is not that different from um other reviews but the the other reviews tend to be for a specific type of pain almost always back pain and we felt that a lot of the problems of chronic pain are common whether people have back pain or knee pain or pelvic pain or um, facial pain. And although it, it can be important in some ways to have groups that are specific for, for, for people and understand the problems better because there are some problems that are more specific, there are an awful lot of problems that are, that are general and um, it, it's important for us to think about psychological aspects and not always think of pain just in terms of anatomical sight. Yeah. So you write about adverse effects, which we rarely see written yeah. about in 
hardly any research study, and I'd love to see more of that. What does this tell us about adverse effects and why should we pay more attention to it? Well, it mainly tells us that people aren't measuring them. Um, I mean, the tempting thing to do is to, and, and a lot of trials do do this, though not so much in the ones we reviewed it this time round. Um, you recruit a whole lot of people, then some drop out. Now, some could be 5%, but it can be nearly 50%. You never know what happens to them. If you ring them up, they often help help you not feel too bad by saying, oh, you know, my cat died or the boiler broke or <laughs> something. And thank you very much. But they don't come back. Um, and then at the end, you only look at the results of those who stuck it out, who might by then even be a minority. And at, at follow-up, it's even a smaller minority who come back. Now, those are presumably the people who've done better, who are happier with it, for whom it's got them some of the way they wanted to go. But that's not telling you about the whole population. And we really need to know, who, know who's made worse because when I worked clinically, I did see some people who became more depressed as they realized, as they started to think more about how much they'd lost and how hard it was going to be. And people are often in a different phase of life from when the pain started. So they can't just <laughs> hope to go back to where they were and pick up. They, you know, they've lost their children's childhoods or their grandchildren's childhoods or their chances at a career. Um, and so, we, and, unless, unless we really try to get to grips, firstly, with people who, who don't get on with it and who drop out, and secondly, looking at our results of those who do stick it and then but don't improve or even get worse. Um, we're really, I mean, that's an important part of the what works for whom question, because ideally, you know, by the end of all these reviews, we will have a much better idea of matching treatment to patient. But if we, if we pretend that people can only get better or stay the same, um, it's not good enough. And, and also my concern is that Often, not only the clinicians kind of rather blame the patient for not improving with treatment, but the patient themselves may feel that it's a personal failure and it may really discourage them from seeking other similar treatment. But it may be that it just wasn't the right timing or they weren't engaged very effectively in the whole process at the beginning and having another go in a little while or with a different team might well be helpful. But if they feel that it's them that's failed, they're not going to be responsive to those opportunities. So I think we need just much more thinking and, and it'd be lovely to, well, would, not necessarily lovely, but it'd be very helpful to hear more from patients who have, do feel they've got worse and who have dropped out so that we have better understanding what we should be looking for at baseline. Because it certainly isn't anything simple. It's not older or younger patients. It's not necessarily those who are most depressed at the beginning or um, those who are most disabled. Uh, it's, it's not going to be simple things that mean that people don't do very well. When I was looking at the adverse effects, of course, pain was oh. the adverse effects. And upon a simple first glance, you think, well, that makes perfect sense. We don't want to cause more pain for people and pain shouldn't increase. Like we are treating pain in some aspect. And then the other part of me thinks, well, with things like rated exposure and in vivo exposure and some of the treatments that are actually wrapped up in traditional CBT, as well as, you know, the more quote unquote third wave or more mindfulness based approaches that have some of that, exposure, whether it's imaginal or interoceptive exposure, I almost wonder if that's, if we should be focusing on that as an adverse effect itself. It's a really interesting thought, isn't it? Because we need to be honest with people at the, at the outset, what the likelihood is of 
increases or decreases in pain by the end and increases and decreases in other outcomes. And if we really don't know, we can't tell them. The problem for me with, with pain is that we know that um, the, the, the rating of pain, or even if you use a more complex measure of, of pain, um, it's very affected by the pain at the moment you fill it in. It's very affected by your mood. Um, and it isn't a simple thing of saying, well, it was seven out of 10 when I started and it's now five out of 10. Um, and I, I mean, I vividly remember a patient who told that he now had, but by a doctor, he now had 50% of the pain he rated himself having at the beginning of treatment and he wanted 50% relief. And so he should be happy. But he said, but the pain's 100% of my pain now. Mm -hmm. And he was right. Of course he wanted the rest to go. Yeah. So I, I really don't know how, how solid ground we're on when we're <laughs> using pain ratings as outcomes in that way. If they certainly matter. I'm concerned if people's pain ratings go up. But I don't know how to understand it if they go down. Maybe it means the intensity is the same, but it just doesn't bother them as much because they're now looking forward to things more and they're sleeping better. Yeah. A couple of things I'd like to pick out of the study and discuss with you. Um, and these are some questions that the community will be interested in thinking about and as they read your paper, which we'll link to in the show notes in that 2020 um, Cochrane Systematic Review. Um, so in your study, there's a clear mention that psychological treatments that are in your study have a relative agnostic approach. And you make note that we really haven't explored how some potentially psychodynamic approaches or the emotional aspect of this uh, with regard to prior experiences or prior adverse experiences have an impact on the treatment of chronic pain. So with that, it, it, I think it, it goes to mention that the studies um, in your review didn't include any of that or potentially did not include any type of treatment along those lines? No, we did actually find uh, several studies that we included in the narrative part of the review, um, which used more psychodynamic methods. And um, they are very interesting and potentially quite promising. There's a lot of interest in trauma in relation to chronic pain and compassion-focused therapy and people learning to generally be kinder to themselves, which of course comes up in our other therapies, but also being able to self-soothe and, um, and, and think, think about the way they treat themselves, as it were, in a, in a different way. And I, I think there's some really interesting ideas coming up and it's great to see them happening in trials. And maybe next time we update this, there'll be a handful and we can actually look at them together. Really, until very recently, um, the only psychodynamic ones were done very, as very long individual treatment, um, which one couldn't really understand what was done because it was so much based around that particular person and often that particular therapist. Um, they didn't give themselves to RCTs, but people are now um, and now bringing these things together and doing some really, really interesting and promising studies. And I mean, I see it a bit like evolution. You know, if you have variety, then if you can exercise some sort of um, effects that work like selection, you should get the best, the most effective out at the other end. I mean, that's, that's a rather crude analogy, but you see what I mean? That, mm -hmm. We need variety in order to learn about what's, what's most useful and what um, doesn't work for a large number of people. You included ACT. In ACT, there is a lot of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. it, it's both looked upon as a process as well as a technique in ACT in many ways. But you didn't look at uh, just pure mindfulness interventions or mindfulness-based stress reduction, 
or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. There's a whole family of, of those, as you know. Yeah. Can you yeah. tell us about why maybe the MBSR, MBCT were left out of the analysis? Well, two related reasons, really. One was that it's very difficult to draw the line um, into what's what's the treatment for pain because often the well quite often the trials are for people with a whole mixed set of disorders you know they might have um chronic fatigue or irritable bowel syndrome or uh, psychological disorders and and people will be in a whole mixed group so it wasn't about just about chronic pain and its outcomes um but also uh you know some were almost like 60 percent yoga 40 percent mindfulness and then that, that's, that's not something we have psychological theories for, nor that we should assume that a psychologist should be the one teaching, as we could be with other psychological therapists. In fact, psychologists might be the fourth or fifth choice of the best person to be doing a mindfulness group. Uh, there are people far more trained in, in, in the methods and the understanding and who've been using them themselves in the meditation practices and so on for a long time. So it just felt that we couldn't, we couldn't put it into the clear categories or, or apply the boundaries in the, in the same way. And I think the mindfulness uh, reviews that are out, out there in the literature have the same problem. They all draw the line at a, at a, at a different place. So some will include um, you know, yoga and tai chi and things where the the mindfulness practices are perhaps more implicit. Yeah. And others so I, I pulled daily, quote, yeah. yeah. I pulled a quote from your paper that I, I'd like to read for everyone. So you said, a typical example of a treatment with insufficient psychological content is a mindfulness meditation treatment that refers only to education and meditation practice and has no theory to support behavior change. So. That statement there is interesting for me to think about because are we saying that mindfulness doesn't really have a proven cognitive component to it? Or are we saying that we haven't been able to support that mindfulness has a, an impact on behavior change the way that other traditional cognitive behavioral therapies have? Yeah, more, more the latter. We were looking for things that were trying to help people change their behavior in relation to pain. And, of course, that can be the outcome of all sorts of things, whether or not they intend it, but it wasn't the explicit uh, intent, particularly when groups were mixed and not everybody had, had pain. So um, it's not that there isn't cognitive content. I'm, I'm sure there's cognitive content, but the aim... I mean, we felt we'd be trying to um, overlay our own ideas of what mindfulness should or uh, could do on, on people's descriptions of, of what they were trying to do. And that, that's, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to um, just take on board the trials which were trying to get people to be more active in the things they wanted to do and less distressed. Hmm. Interesting. And then... Many of the trials were uh, multidisciplinary, mm -hmm. so they included psychology, but other professional interventions, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, I'm sure, other types of counseling and art therapy. Um, where does exercise therapy fit into this? Because when I think of exercise, um, socially and culturally, we kind of break it down into this thing that is meant for, to make us robust and healthy, <laughs> although we know that there are cognitive and affect dimensions that are at work, no matter who is providing the exercise intervention, just based on how that's provided. Yes, no, exercise is a very important part, or working towards goals, and so, when the focus is more on people working towards goals, and of course everyone's goals are different and the working towards them is often done away from the program itself, not all of it necessarily, then the exercise tends to take a more generic 
um, strengthening, improving, slightly improving aerobic capacity and stretching and just getting people to have more confidence in their bodies and to, in a way, relate better to their body, you know, feel their bodies can give them good feelings as well as bad ones. Um, and that's really, I think, been a move over time from the kind of, you know, programs where every day you do an hour's very routinized exercise, which doesn't necessarily carry over into being able to sit long enough to have supper with your family or walk far enough that you can um, shop easily when you get there, that kind of, that kind of thing. So it's, it's moved from the traditional exercise to much more functional. Still physical therapists doing it, and of course they can be very analytic about what units, as it were, need to change to enable the activities. Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's an aspect of operant or behavioral therapy within any exercise instruction. Yes, absolutely. And I think physiotherapists have become more and more psychological in their practice over time. And, the, you know, the more that happens, the better, really, if we're all using the same methods and some, the same language to help people change, then that's an asset. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk for a moment about ACT, because that's a big part of your study, and probably the most controversy, I'd say, that came out of the study, yeah. the most questions, is with regard to that. So I was going through the review, and it's hard for me to calculate the exact number, but there are probably somewhere between 20 to 30 different studies on ACT that, they, that were excluded. So there's a lot of studies there, and some of those were actually um, meta-analyses and systematic reviews, but did not meet Cochrane standards, so to speak. Is that correct? Uh, some of them were RCTs, but didn't meet Cochrane standards, yeah. 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 And you said there's much enthusiasm for ACT shown in many non-Cochrane reviews, which may include many small trials that report beneficial outcomes, but there's no high quality evidence to support the findings. High quality, adequately powered trials are needed, preferably multi-center and run by investigators with equipose. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that for a moment? Yes. Um, one of the problems is that when any therapy is new, the trials tend to be done by people who are fantastically enthusiastic about that therapy. I mean, enthusiastic enough that they, you know, they're the ones who will stay up late at night and write all the stuff that gets the grant to get to do the trial. I mean, I, you know, it's admirable that their enthusiasm drives them to that, but when you're trying to think of it from the point of view of a randomized controlled trial, when you really want everything but the actual treatment people get to be equal between the two arms, if people are getting either someone who is very enthusiastic, very committed, or somebody who's just standing in front of them and reading from an education script, which is a common control, um, you know, <laughs> you can see how there are going to be differences there that aren't just about the treatment they get. So we would, and, and there have been several treatments that are CBT versus ACT. Um, they're not actually in our review, but they've all been done by ACT enthusiasts. And it's quite interesting because although the results show the two both to have, you know, to bring benefits, not exactly the same ones, but uh, equal in some ways. Uh, when you read the abstract, you believe that ACT is far superior to CBT. So there's a bit of spin in all this. And we would like to see the spin come out of talking about ACT and some more thinking about common pathways, common processes, um, as we were talking about earlier in terms of you know, measuring acceptance and flexibility and things in, in, in CBT. You know, is, understanding is not going to be fostered by saying we've got the best thing and... Mm -hmm. So that's what we mean by equipoise, really. We want, um, we want something that's replicable beyond the enthusiasts who did it in the trial. Um, we want it to be doable across lots of centers um, and, and for someone else to be able to read the manual and do it, you know, if they have the background training, right. not for it to rely on um, charisma and uh, passion. So there was a study in the 2011 Journal of Pain 
It's a meta-analysis and systematic view. I'm sure you've read acceptance-based interventions for the treatment of pain. And the outcome, uh, Vihoff was the um, publisher there if people want to access it. But the outcome was the effect size of ACT was somewhere between 0.3 to 0.4, which is in that small range effect size. So it looks like it's comparable to CBT. So my question, and there are nine RCTs in there, and as you mentioned, they're smaller. I guess my question is, if we're finding, based on your study, that CBT has small effect sizes, and this study, even though it's based on smaller RCTs, and I agree with you, I'd love to see more research, yet they find equal effect sizes, is ACT potentially a good alternative for people who've maybe gone through CBT or maybe CBT doesn't necessarily um, fit for them or interest them. And it's a healthy alternative for them to look toward with regard to overcoming pain. Um, in principle, it could be. I mean, in fact, that 2011 review, he mixed randomized control trials and unrandomized trials. So some of it is pre-post, which is not the same thing at all as having a control. And it tends to inflate um, the effect sizes. So I, I thought they were a bit bigger than that. Um, in his 2016 review, I'm pretty sure he just used RCTs. Um, and people often ask, you know, is, I mean, yes, it, yes, in a way, of course, it's, it's an alternative and we need to be, um, you know, we need to, to be understanding what, the, the size of changes it makes. But, um, it, it could be that people who are helped by CBT are also helped by ACT, and people who aren't helped by CBT also aren't helped by ACT. Mm -hmm. So, you know, while it'd be very convenient that we have two or three or four types of treatment, and if one doesn't work, one of the others pretty, pretty well is likely to, um, I don't think we know enough about them to know that that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I think... Uh, I think we could we could find that some people really need rather different treatment and different forms of delivery. Uh, I mean, another thing I really wished we were able to do, uh, and I've never seen done except very occasionally in single cases, is when people are very, very disabled. I think treatment needs to be spread over a year or two, not weeks yeah. or, that, or months. That brings uh, me to my... Nobody's doing that. Yeah. Yeah. That brings me to my next point, which I think was an important part of your uh, review, where you, your, your recommendations to funders was that we take CBT now and we explore it in psychiatric comorbidities, mild cognitive dysfunction, learning disabilities, opioid overuse, and those with otherwise unrepresented in the literature. And I think that's really important. Yeah, no, it is. It's um, those people who are excluded from trials uh, very commonly because in trials you want as far as possible for the population to be not have too many other things going on that could affect the results and you want to be able to describe them well but of course in clinical populations I mean people are treating such patients of course they are yeah. but they're often being a bit cautious and there isn't the evidence there um, but there are plenty of of, uh, in fact, it's probably commoner to have other problems as well than to have just chronic pain and the rest of your life to be going swimmingly. So um, th those are really important. They're urgently needed. And it's a bit frustrating. It feels like people go on doing the same, well, very similar sort of CBT versus nothing and CBT versus a minimal control again and again with tiny differences when, in fact, it really matters that we get to grips with people who are stuck on opioids and told they should come off them but understandably terrified not feeling they're being offered anything in you know in, in exchange um i have i have seen it used cbt used with people with mild learning difficulties who have huge unacknowledged problems with pain people really listen to them much less than they do to the average person who complains of chronic pain um, quite successfully, particularly some of the behavioral methods and creating routines and so on, but cognitive methods too. And I would just like to see much more of that going on.
Yeah, there's so many different types of populations to study, which we're Absolutely. not seeing other than fibromyalgia and low back pain. And these are patients that we see every day. Yeah. 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 No, it's, I'm, I'm really pleased you raised that because th there are no, there are virtually no trials in any of those areas and we really badly need them. Yeah. I mean, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today, and I appreciate the work that you're doing, both in research as well as clinically. Can you tell people how they can learn more about you and follow your work? Yes, I've got a web page at University College London, um, and I'll give you the link to that, and that uh, gives you publication links and so on. Okay, and we'll link to that in the show notes so you can all access it and find Dr. Amanda Williams at the University College of London, of course make sure to check out her study called Psychological Therapies for the Management of Chronic Pain in Adults. It was a review in the August 2020 Cochrane Library of Systematic Reviews. I'm Dr. Joe Tad. It's been a pleasure being with you this week. Make sure you share this episode with your friends and family on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, wherever, everyone, wherever anyone's hanging out talking about the effective and safe treatment of chronic pain. I'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. To subscribe to the podcast and learn more, visit integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. That's integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. Sign up to receive weekly updates, leave a review on iTunes, and share this episode with your friends.